This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Welcome to this episode of the podcast, Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur. And I'm honored today to be talking with Lee Cockrell about creating Disney magic for your organization. Making the leap from being a corporate leader and expert into becoming a solopreneur can be daunting, but the rewards are great. You can work when you want, where you want, and do the work you love. And I can be that guide and thinking partner for you. As your coach, I'll help you go farther and faster based on what I've learned from being on this journey for several years. If you even have some thoughts about starting an encore career, please contact me and take the quiz available on my website. So I am delighted and honored to have Lee Cockrell with us today. Lee is the former Executive Vice President of Operations for the Walt Disney World Resort. As the Senior Operating Executive for 10 years, Lee led a team of 40,000 cast members and was responsible for the operations of 20 resort hotels, four theme parks, two water parks, a shopping and entertainment village, and the ESPN Sports and Recreation Complex, in addition to the ancillary operations which supported the number one vacation destination in the world. One of Lee's major and lasting legacies was the creation of Disney Great Leader Strategies, which was used to train and develop the 7,000 leaders at Walt Disney World. Lee has held various executive positions in the hospitality and entertainment business with Hilton Hotels for eight years and the Marriott Corporation for 17 years before joining Disney. Today, Lee has also launched the Cockrell Academy, which is designed to fill in the blanks and give you the tools you need to focus on being the kind of leader people admire, doing the right things to manage your organization, and serving the people in a way that sets you apart. And we're going to be talking with Lee about his experiences after all of his successes at Disney. Some of the things we'll talk about are, how did you start your journey from corporate life to independent work? What were some of the mindset changes you found between the two? How did you think about crafting your value proposition as a now newly independent practitioner? How did you seek out to find your early clients and customers? And then through it out at all, we'll ask Lee about his thoughts on leadership. Today, our special guest is Lee Cockrell, the man that created Disney Magic. And we want to talk with him about his journey on becoming an entrepreneur and having a really successful business in his own right. So, Lee, if you'd like to talk a little about how you got started and what you're up to. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma and I tell people we were pretty poor. We didn't even have an indoor John, my grandkids don't believe me, but it was a fairly dysfunctional family. My mother was married five times. I've been adopted twice. I got my name Cockrell, was my third name, my husband number four when I was 16. But the good thing was my mother started marrying guys that had money. So I got to go to college, but I forgot to go to class. So I promptly flunked out after a couple of years. I don't know if I flunked out, but it was close enough. My mother wasn't happy. So I went in the army and I learned a lot there about discipline and there's a way to do things and following orders and being on time to work. (laughs) All those, although I had worked my whole life, you know, when you grow up on a farm, you work. And then I, even when we moved to the city, I worked in a lumberyard. I drove a delivery car for a pharmacy. I always had a job. So when I got out of the Army, I met a fellow. We went to Washington, D.C. He was going to open the Washington Hilton Hotel up on Connecticut Avenue. That's the hotel where Reagan got shot by John Hinckley when he was coming out of there in 83, I think. I worked there for Hilton for eight years, got into a management training program after that, and stayed with Hilton eight years, Chicago, Washington, New York, L.A., all over the place. And then I joined Marriott, stayed 17 years. I had focused on the food and beverage business, so I'd kind of become an expert in food and beverage running restaurants, restaurants, uh, banquets, hotels. And so Marriott hired me to run a restaurant complex for them in Philadelphia, did that, eventually became the vice president of the food and beverage operations for Marriott worldwide and stayed with them 17 years. And then I got recruited by Disney in 1990 to go to France, open Disneyland Paris, but they wanted me to open their restaurants. So I was back in food and beverage again. And so I always tell people it's a good idea to be really good at something. (laughs) You can always fall back on if the other things don't work out over time. 
I did that for three years, and then I came back to Orlando. They brought me back to Orlando in 97. I was put in charge of all the operations at Walt Disney World. Did that for 10 years. And then I retired when I was 62 and started my business, which is what you want to talk about. And I thought I had a lot to tell people because I'd had three great companies, Hilton, Marriott, and Disney. And uh, I'd learned a lot. I'd lived all over the world. I uh, experienced a lot and always thought about wanting to write a book about all that. Of course, my insecurity wouldn't let me write a book. (laughs) But eventually, I ran into a lady who was a book publisher in New York. And she said, I'll take care of that. I'll get it published. And so I wrote the first book and she took care of it. And today, uh, that first book, Creating Magic, is in 22 languages around the world. And I've written four, one on management, one on leadership, one on customer service, time management is one, and another one on how to keep your career under control when you have these obstacles show up in your life, like this pandemic or a recession or a boss that doesn't love you. I had a good career. I wanted to do something. I just started speaking while I was at Disney. I couldn't accept any fees, of course. So I gave it to, they donate money to a charity for that. And so I got some experience with that. And then I wrote a weekly newsletter to 50,000 people at Disney on leadership, management, customer service, all those kinds of things. So I got more and more involved in it. And I had an interest in it and read a lot about it, read a lot about time management, how to get more organized. And so I just kept doing it. And so when I retired, I put up a website and I said, here's what I've done. Here's what I can teach your people if you want to use me. And no doubt the Disney name really grabs people's attention. <laughs> it's not Lee Cockrell. It's, wow, this guy's from Disney. And I think it's because everybody knows Disney executes very well and they want to know, how do you do that? So that got me started. And I just started picking up speeches here and there. And I kept writing my second, third, and fourth books. And I started a uh, blog back in the blog days and started getting distribution of those thoughts. It expanded around the world. That's what's the great thing about the internet. And then I started a podcast six years ago with Jody Mayberry, who we were talking about a minute ago. And we're about to hit 3 million downloads on that. So it's been very popular. Jody's been good at working with me to keep it down to 15 minutes. That gets people, I think, to listen to it because it's short and sweet. You don't get stuck for a long time. Then we started the Cockerel Academy about six months ago because it's an online academy where you can take eight courses now. A new one just came out last week. Another one will be out in January. And it's a subscription. We're charging $249. And you buy it. You have it for a year. And you can take all the courses. And each course has workbooks and it has a video and audio and become popular. And I'm sitting at home waiting for the pandemic to be over with. <laughs> That's my life. I think the keys were you got to know what you want to sell if you're going to have your own business and why would anybody buy it from you? And do you have the knowledge and do you have the presence and do you have the ability to convince people that you have something they should buy and that they can learn from? Certainly for Disney, that helped a lot. But I think anybody, if you've got a lot of expertise in some subject, whatever it is, you can start to build that. And there are people out there that probably have an interest in what you are great at. And then you try to find them and you, and you try to get them to pay you to tell them how to be better at what they're doing. So it's worked out great. I do speeches. I've done six or 700 speeches since I retired all over the world. It's just kind of taken on a life of its own. And even during the pandemic, people have agreed to go online and do it versus having an in-person. I think we're all getting used to it. That's why people are starting to say, well, well, that works okay too, because it's about what can I learn? So that's kind of my story. Uh, If you'd have told me I would ever write a book, I would have said you're the craziest person in the world. I could barely read one. Dropped out of speech class in college because I was terrified to give a speech. I always tell people, do the hard things, work your way through them. You can. Everything's hard before it's easy. And you don't love doing it. And it's hard. But if you keep doing it, you get better at it. And it's never too late to get better. And I keep learning that. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm 30 now or I'm 40 or I'm 15. <laughs> it's never too late to do whatever you want to do and try to get people over that because most of that problem is in your head. I tell people half the stuff in your brain is not even true. So quit listening to it. It lies to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and half the stuff your parents taught you is not true either. So be careful what you believe. <laughs> I have a good friend that told me getting started in my business, as it were, Lynn, you have to be comfortable practicing in public. There's going to be some new stuff that you're going to be kind of bad at to start with, but you keep at it. (laughs) I learned that nobody knows what they're doing, so I'm in the same boat as everybody, so it works out okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm, I'm curious, as you first got started, what were some of the, I'll say, mindset changes, the things you found that were different from being in corporate life versus on your own? For me, I know there were some things that, oh, this is different. (laughs) 
Yeah, everything, because I had to pay for anything I wanted. I didn't have an HR, a marketing, a sales, a webmaster. I didn't have a technology person. And I soon found that they're expensive. So I started learning how to do all that stuff. And so I have people that I pay on a fee basis when I need them. But each time I try to learn what they're doing and learn how to do it myself. And so that was different. But it's amazing how much you learn when you have to. And again, it was hard, but I learned how to do it, fumbling through it sometimes. So that was different. And not having a big corporation behind you, all that expertise of I can pick up the phone and call IT, I could call anybody I wanted. And since I had a great job, everybody would do what I asked them to do. <laughs> now, I even told my wife won't even help me now. So I'm uh, on my own. But that's the main thing. You got to just take a few risks, go out there and do it. And most of my business comes from referral. Or somebody will hear the podcast or they'll hear, read one of my books or they'll have been in a speech that I gave somewhere there from another company and I'll get a call from them. And I'm doing one in January from a company that I spoke to maybe six or seven years ago. The guy is now in another company and he's the president and he called me. I'm working with a company out of Japan, Takeda a Pharmaceutical. This guy was in one of my speeches nine years ago when he was with Merck. And now he's with this company. I mean, so it's amazing. You just never know where. That's what I love the internet. You can just get your message out there. People can find you. (laughs) You can find about anybody you want to these days. And if you have a good message, you have good content and you're believable. You know, I think a lot of it's in the presentation, not just in the material. Telling stories about how it really works and how, no, young people today don't want theory anymore. They want you to tell them how to do things. They don't want some professor telling them from a book 40 years ago how leadership is. It's different. It's always different. It's changing every day. Young people today, you know, we know they leave a job in a couple of years if they're not feeling like they're making any progress. And not like me, I stayed and took the beatings (laughs) in corporate America all those years. But the young people today, they're really smart. And they know how to do things. And a lot of them know how to do things we don't know how to do. And we also maybe have a little wisdom they don't have. So working together with them, figuring out how to work with young people is really important. Somebody says, oh, there are problems. Say, well, it's all we got. You better figure it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, and from my personal experience, I recall when I was in my 20s, I wasn't probably the easiest employee to have around either. But some of that, we all think we were better than we were. <laughs> and I think we all... Always do. (laughs) (laughs) So in terms of as you were getting started with your Creating Magic was your first book, and then you moved on to some different subjects. What was the things that as you were starting saying, hey, this is where I think I can add value or people will pay me for this? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I was always very disciplined. But in 1980, I took a two-day time management course because my boss made us our whole team go from Marriott. And I really learned a system about how to think about what you're going to do every day, this week, this month, this year, uh, how to delegate. And you don't have to know everything yourself. And I got over a lot of those beliefs I had that I didn't want to tell somebody I didn't know something because it would be embarrassing. And I got really good at getting things done. And that discipline probably is one of the main reasons I had a successful career. So I started teaching it and I developed my own course. And that's 35 more years ago. And I wrote the book, Time Management Magic, How to Get More Done every day. I think it's important because most kids don't learn it in high school and college. Somehow we don't teach that course about discipline, how to plan, how to project management, really. I guess project management students know how to do it, but the average student doesn't. And they get a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, more stuff coming at them. Their mother's not there anymore. (laughs) They got all this stuff to do. They got a class. They got to get it in. They got to register. They've got to get their laundry done. I mean, and so I teach that all over. And that book has been very successful because At every level, executives too struggle with how do you get all this done? And some of the obvious ways are hire better people so you don't have to worry about performance. You doing everything and make sure training is really strong because that's how you get people to feel good about their job and feel comfortable and confident. And last, the culture, treat them right. You know, I say the key is hire them right, train them right, and treat them right. You'll have a good organization where you can get more done because when people know you're committed to them, they'll do more for you. Turnover goes down. You know, if you know I'm committed to you, you'll take care of me. And so that's time management. That was a big one. Then customer service, customer rules was a a random house asked me to write that after I did Creative Magic. And 
it's really 39 kind of simple kinds of things you can do to take better care of your customers than your competitor does. And they're simple. They don't cost a lot of money, but they're things that we forget that our mother probably taught us, but we forgot. <laughs> so be nice is yeah. one. <laughs> you know, be available. Tell people the truth. So all of those, and that's done extremely well too. That's in about 15 languages now around the world and doing well. And a lot of, the other good thing about these books is universities have picked them up as textbooks. So that's great because then every year I get sales. <laughs> New students. It's just common sense stuff. It's well done. I think it has credibility because of Marriott and Disney and uh, stories I tell about how you can do it and not underestimate what you can achieve. Because, you know, when you're 20, when I was 20, I didn't know yeah, I could do anything. If you'd have told me 35 years later, I'd be running Disney World operations. I was like, man, you're the craziest guy in the world. <laughs> and, you know, things happen if you focus on getting better. And I think getting around the right people and the right organizations that care about you and train you and teach you and develop you and that you get experience and exposure too, not just education, but experience. Experience is the powerful, man, that's the way you learn and exposure to the world, exposure to people from all backgrounds. I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma. I had no exposure when I was 20. I mean, literally none, zero. All of a sudden now I'm in the army and then I'm working in Washington, D.C. Oh my God. And when you're in the hospitality business, people are from everywhere and they become your friends. You don't care what religion they are. You don't care if they're gay. You don't care anything. It's just, that's the way it is. And I always encourage young people today uh, when they get out of college, just probably go off to a big city and work for five years, learn about people, get exposure, experience, commute to work on the subway. <laughs> it's all those things that really make you a different person. And the last book was Career Magic. It's how to overcome the obstacles you're going to face in your career. They are going to happen. Could be your fault, may not be your fault. You might get a boss that doesn't work out well. You may hate the job. You may hate the city. You may get in the wrong marriage. But, and I've been through a lot of that stuff, not the marriage. I've been married 52 years. So it's really a matter of an attitude. Don't try to blame somebody. Just pick yourself up and move on. And that's what I've done. My wife and I moved 11 times. I've been with three companies and we go where the opportunities are and Hopefully I behave better after I either get fired or passed over. <laughs> and so the last 25 years of my career were pretty successful because by then I'd matured and I quit trying to be a smart ass, you know, uh, like <laughs> you are when you're young. Sometimes I was trying to fix the people above me. That wasn't working very well, but you learn, you learn finesse, you learn how to be a better leader, how to coach people, how to manage people, how to lead people, how to be nicer, frankly, <laughs> how to just be nice. People have a lot of problems. I don't need to make them any worse. As I think, obviously, a lot of the teaching you do has to do with ideas around customer experience. Well, as you think of that in the context as uh, I'm a company of one, how do I work on my skills with customer experience when I'm out trying to sell whatever my expertise is? Yeah, I think the customer rules book might be helpful to you because it really gives you those kind of, it's about professionalism. A lot of the things in there are things that people may not know because they don't have the experience and exposure yet, which I learned working at the Waldorf Astoria in New York or working in these famous places where you had to learn to make sure your shoes were shined and that you presented yourself properly. And you had bosses and mentors who taught you what professionalism looks like and how to greet the customer and how to be organized and follow up. So, you know, being reliable is one thing. Be reliable, be credible, be a person who keeps your promises. You get back to your customers. You uh, keep in touch with your customers. As soon they think about you as much better than anybody else they deal with because you've developed that relationship. Check in with them every month and see how they're doing. And even if there's not, you're not always trying to sell them something, making sure they know you're a Available. They have your phone number. They can get in touch with you. Or you answer your phone. <laughs> you do whatever they need to take care of them as individuals. And you build this reliability and credibility. And that's hard for a customer to walk away from somebody like that because they get emotionally committed to you. They go, wow, this guy just, I, he's there for me. And I know I can always count on him. I got enough problems in my life, but he doesn't create any of them. He solves them. When there's a snowstorm, he gets the product here. And that's the kind of thing, you know, reliability and credibility and keeping your promise. This is the big thing. When something goes wrong, you fix it. You fix it twice. And we see that at Disney. When we screw up and we fix it, we got people even more committed to us, our customers. We went out of the way and we're not afraid to say we're sorry. And then we don't try to blame somebody else. You know, it's kind of things your mom would teach you, you know, <laughs> be trustworthy, be reliable, do what you say you're going to do, be nice to people, be kind. When in doubt, go in favor of the customer, you know, give them a break. Don't try to fight with them and argue and win the battle. 
That's a short-term battle. And it's an attitude, I think. You know, I think I was telling people, excellence is really a state of mind. That's what it is. Everything you do, you're going to do it better than everybody else. When you think about that, it becomes a part of who you are and people trust you. I think trust is probably the main thing. Get trust and you can sell them anyway. (laughs) You know, if they trust you and they know you'll take care of if it doesn't work out. I mean, it's amazing. Trust. If we can trust somebody, we love working with them. It's easier to sign the contract. I can sign it quicker. I know you'll work with me to fix it if there's a problem. So that's what I try to do with my clients. I do whatever they want. I don't just go give a speech and walk out. I tell them I'll do a breakout, a speech, I'll send them materials, I'll follow up with them later. I say, I'll give you all of me you can stand for the price of my fees. And they love that because everybody compares you to everybody else. And I want them to be thinking about me different than everybody else. Absolutely. (laughs) You know, that's how you got to think. What can I do that nobody else does? Yep. Good. Sort of on a more tactical point, you've built up a great body of work, the books and the speeches and and the podcasts and stuff. And now you've got Cockrell Academy. What was kind of your thinking as you said, hey, that's going to be the next step for me? You know, I always thought I wanted to do that, and it didn't become so clear to me how you could do it until the Internet showed up, you know, because how do you get classes out there? Sure, I've done some professor's guides for two of my books, and I've got some professors that picked them up and are using them, but how do you get wide reach to everybody, not just through professors who might teach a course? The Internet offered that opportunity and the ability to record it and edit it and to put the right content out there. And to market it, you know, it doesn't matter what you got if you can't reach anybody. If nobody will buy it, it's it's not the best idea in the world, or maybe the best idea. It's not going to be satisfactory. So the internet really added all of that, and developing the courses was pretty easy. I had the content, I had the books, I had the experience, I had the stories to tell, and I had good advice for people that from all the mistakes maybe I made or could have done better. And Jody, I think Jody Mayberry was the one. He's got all the technical expertise, so. I just talk. He does all the hard work, like get it edited and get it programmed and get it, make sure we don't have mistakes in it and the graphics and setting up the systems and all that. So having a good partner too, somebody who can do that kind of work while you work, focus on the content. So that's pretty much the formula we use. We keep looking for new ways to promote it and market it and things like talking to you this morning, you know, the name of the games, get the information out there so people know about it. Somebody told us you don't sell much if people don't know about it. (laughs) And so you can have the greatest product in the world. Nobody knows about it. And today, there's so much stuff on the Internet that you got to really have a strong message and a good presentation because people just blow it off. We keep focusing on that. We're focused on young people and older people, too, because older people are trying to catch up with how do you stay ahead during this economic systems we have now and technology advancing every week. Half the battle of that is older people ought to be using younger people more. Talk to them. Talk to them. they got ideas that we'll never think about being more inclusive. I tell people, your customers and your employees know everything you need to know if you can just get them to tell you. you know, They know everything you need to know to make your business better. And we don't use them. We go out and hire consultants when we got them right inside our company. <laughs> yeah. Being from 50 miles away doesn't necessarily make you smarter than the people that are already there. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, yeah. a lot of people are just lucky where they are. Yeah. yeah, one of the reasons, of course, I started this idea is in my background in manufacturing, the biggest problem we have right now is we don't have enough talent. And yet, on the other hand, I see people like myself who are retiring from corporate world and playing golf, but they'd probably still like to participate and share their expertise. So I'm trying to help people find a way to do that. They don't want a 60-hour a week grind job, but they're more than happy to help some small company with the expertise that they have. So that, again, that's one of my goals with the work that I'm doing here with what I call the silver entrepreneur. And I think a lot of companies want that too. They would love to get it because they can't afford to have a big staff. They can't afford to go out and hire big expensive consultants if they can find, you know, I even say that for retired people, being more helpful with the public school system, go in and talk to the students. Students love it when somebody from the outside comes in. And I would say your clients should not underestimate that if they keep talking to small businesses, how they can help them and tell them what they can do for them, how they can do it, how it's going to reach their bottom line and lower turnover and improve customer satisfaction. People are going to say, well, okay. Yeah, you start to get a reputation and a message gets around town and somebody else will call you and somebody else will call you. Or you get four or five businesses to go together and split your fee, do it together with them. It could be Wednesday nights from five to seven. I mean, there's a lot of ways to help people do it and just figuring that out. Yep. 
Well, I sure want to thank you. I want to honor your time here today, but I appreciate this. Any final thoughts you might want to share with the audience? Yeah, I would say one is don't underestimate what you can achieve. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter what you just get with it. And if you need help, get help. Sometimes you can't do everything by yourself. Go find somebody that'll work with you. Jody was the best thing that happened to me because he pushes me. You know, every Wednesday I have to talk to him at 11 o'clock and we do stuff. So we meet at least 52 times a year and schedule the priorities in your life. When you schedule them, they get done. When you think you're going to do them, when you get time, they don't get done. (laughs) Don't underestimate your influence. We all know something. We can use it. People need it. And if we'd all think about being good teachers instead of bosses, we'd be better off. So teach. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. Well, again, thank you much, Lee, and you have a great day. You take care, sir. Again, my deepest thanks to Lee for his insights and knowledge on becoming an entrepreneur. A quick recap, we talked about how he started his journey from corporate life to independent work. What were some of the mindset changes he found between the two? How did he think about crafting his value proposition as an independent practitioner? How did he seek out early clients and customers? And what are some of his thoughts in general on leadership? We'll also have Lee's contact information if you want to follow up with him or his organization. So just to wrap up here on this episode, remember with an Encore career, the rewards are great. You can work when you want, where you want, and do the work you love. And as your coach, I can help you go farther and faster based on what I've learned and from being on this journey for several years. You now have the time, attention, and money to make this leap, so let me help you. And if you have thoughts about starting an Encore career, please contact me. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.